This is the research work group, the last of 2022. So um, I know this is a weird week for us, but we wanted to get another one in. Um, we have a meeting today with some of our strong Annie members. Um, as you know, Lisa Thomas uh, Thompson and I are the co-chairs for the research work group. So we welcome you here. And if you're in any of the other Annie groups or if you're here off of invitation, we welcome you. Um, we meet every week to, uh, every week, I wish, every month to discuss um, research related to environmental health. And this week we have um, a manuscript in process of, um, that myself and some other team members have um, completed. And so I'm gonna share the slides and then we'll get started. How's that look? Looks good. Wonderful. Um, so Daniel Smith is the PI on this project, which is, uh, as you can see, their interventions to reduce the impact of climate change on health in rural communities. That's the key here is, is rural spaces. And uh, we are, me and Daniel are both from North Carolina. So we were just laughing about our country, North Carolina accents, um, but he is, he is up North now, that's okay. Uh, he's, still, he's still one of ours, but uh, this was a systematic review that I was allowed to join and I appreciate, um, got some great experiences with that. Uh, we had a, a big team, um, uh, Ruth, as you know, I was at your presentation Monday. She's been very busy. Uh, this week, um, and Lisa Thompson um, was also a part of this systematic review. And you can see the other members of our team, um, members of Annie, as well as you know, librarians, uh, students uh, across three different universities. So Daniel is going to um, lead most of this talk and the other, presenters will jump in as needed. So okay. take it away, Daniel, and just let me know um, when you want me to advance the slide. Yeah, okay, will do. Thank you, Liz. So I think it's important to first recognize how many hands <laughs> had a part of the systematic review at one point or another. So you can see we have individuals from four different organizations spanning from one of the fellows of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, uh, Sheila Stone, Dr. Liz Mizell from East Carolina. We had a group, this is where I started at, was Emory University. We had Sharon Leslie, our librarian. We had an undergraduate research assistant. We had another volunteer clinical instructor who was trying to get into research. Uh, Dr. Lisa Thompson, who was the, the senior author on this from the initial version of the systematic review to what you'll see today. And we'll talk about that on the next slide of how the systematic review changed over time. It was actually um, really interesting to go through the process twice almost. And then we have all of our team members from Villanova University, which is where I'm at now. We had two undergraduate volunteers. We had a graduate research assistant, Anna Smith, who has been working with me, and then Dr. Ruth McDermott-Levy, and then me. Um, and you can advance the slide, Liz. And so this is the background really for this systematic review. But before we jump into this systematic review, I think it's interesting. This review to me is affectionately known as the systematic review from hell. <laughs> um, we had over for this final one, we had 7,000 articles we had to review. But what really started that loving name was this was our second iteration of a systematic review that we had tried to get off the ground. So the first one that we conducted or we thought about conducting was a systematic review on how to create climate um, climate friendly health systems or climate resilient health systems. So we're going through the process. We've requested review help from our librarian at Emory University. We've created all of our, our search terms. We've done, we've identified 
a couple of articles that we would be happy if they ended up in the final one. And as a part of any systematic review, you go and you register them on um, one of the many registration sites. And as we were going to register our first systematic review on climate resilient health systems, lo and behold, what did we find other than a registration for a review on climate resilient health systems. So we had to really kind of tweak what we were doing. And this is where our team really came together because at first it was me, Lisa, Liz, and Sheila that were really kind of the four brains behind, well, what are we doing? What questions are we asking? And so it was Sheila's, um, she affectionately calls herself a um, troublemaker because she always asks the, the seemingly stupid questions where someone would raise their hand at me like this is a stupid question but xyz and so the review also showed us that there are no stupid questions because it was through sheila's really kind of asking her questions that we got to our final our or this final question of well what interventions are being done rather than in health systems to create climate resilient health systems what are we doing to keep people in rural areas healthy and safe due to climate change and so from that, we know that climate change is going to be the greatest public health threat of the 21st century. Um, yes, we like to think currently that COVID is kind of one of the, the greatest public health threat. However, COVID and other infectious diseases are going to be more common due to climate change. And so climate change touches everything about health. And over the next 80 years is really going to be the driver of everything that we do in public health to keep us healthy. Uh, particularly within rural areas. So climate change is going to uniquely impact rural areas due to their geographical isolation and those already kind of baseline greater health inequities that exist rather from rural poverty, lack of resources, um, concentrations of populations that are known to be disenfranchised, vulnerable, whichever word du jour you want to choose to talk about those populations. Um, and then compared to urban areas, we also know less about how climate change is going to impact rural regions. So if you think about it, a lot of work that's been done thus far with climate change in urban areas is really focused on flooding and heat. So we know that there are neighborhood heat signatures, um, the urban heat island effect. We know that urban areas, particularly those that were built on marshes and <laughs> where nature's natural transition zone from the sea to land are going to be flooding, particularly on the East Coast. We have some pretty big cities that are on those zones, Philadelphia being one, uh, New York being another. But then whenever we start to think about rural areas, the research just really hasn't call up for rural areas. And so that's where we were really thinking about, well, what do we do? What comes next? What has been done? If we're doing intervention planning for my career as an assistant professor, well, where do I go? Where are the holes in the literature? Um, and next slide, please, Liz. And so that's where this review came out of. Um, so we really wanted to identify what, um, feasibility, either feasibility studies with interventions or true interventions had been done in order to improve those climate related health outcomes in rural regions of the United States. Um, the purpose of the review was to describe and evaluate the strength of said interventions and then to address the disease burden of climate change within the rural United States. Um, and we were hoping to do this in order to not only guide my own research, but also the research of all of the other PIs and researchers and even students that were on the the review team is well where were these holes again I mentioned that earlier and what has been done what could we potentially propose and then also set priorities for those that are wanting to work in interventions and implementation science in rural areas by doing this review um, next slide and so this was our search criteria. This was kind of where everything, once we had figured out that we wanted to focus on interventions in rural areas, we needed a framework to really drive the study. So one of the big issues whenever you're thinking about climate change is that case definition. Well, what is a climate change related death? What is a climate change related disease process? And so we focused on the CDC's wheel as we affectionately call it, or the wheel. And it is a wheel that the CDC has designed to talk about the impact of climate change change on human health. And so as you'll see, you see at the innermost sector of the wheel, you have the different effects of climate change that the wheel focuses on. So you have rising temperatures, more 
extreme weather, rising sea levels, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. And then that middle level of the wheel are the actual events themselves that are predicted or already are happening due to rising temperatures. So example, rising temperatures gives us extreme heat, severe weather, so on and so forth. And there are eight different pieces of this wheel. And it was these eight that are in the middle, the severe weather, extreme heat, environmental degradation, water and food supply impacts, the water quality impacts, um, and then the three others that I won't read, that this were the different areas of our review. And then on the outside are just some examples. And it's not an all-inclusive list as we had this discussion many times as we were like, well, we're using this framework to guide the study. If there's an extreme heat uh, intervention been done for a health outcome on extreme heat, but it's not heat-related illness or death or cardiovascular failure, do we include it or not? It's really this wheel is just giving us examples. And so it gave us the leeway to be like, yes, we can still include it. Um, but you'll see there's examples for all eight. And then from this, our poor librarian, she had to write searches for all eight not. of these pieces of the wheel. So essentially we did eight systematic reviews and one would not recommend <laughs> If you're a PhD student or anyone else thinking about doing one of these, really, really, really focus on having as tight of a definition as possible, because we essentially did, as I said, those eight different systematic reviews. We had to write our search terms for extreme heat, for air pollution, for changes in vector ecology for each one in PubMed. And then we also had to translate them across the different databases. And so ultimately, I want to say we had, if I'm doing the math right in my head, we had 24 searches that were done across three different databases to give us our final number of article or abstracts that we were reviewing. Um, our inclusion criteria, we wanted to focus solely on interventions. Um, as you'll kind of see as we go through this, the definition of what an intervention was became very, very loose. It could be a one-on-one -on -one intervention. It could be a population-based intervention. We even had a couple of policies um, that were analyzed as interventions themselves for reducing, particularly around pollution and farming. Um, but with the environmental degradation piece, we felt like that was an acceptable intervention to include. We wanted our studies to be focused on humans because there has been some work that has talked about um, restoring habitats due to climate change and sea level rise. And there have been interventions that have been done on that. And while there's that one health perspective of, well, if we keep the environment healthy, we're gonna ultimately keep humans healthy. We were more interested in those direct interventions that were being directly thought about or conducted for human health. We included articles in either English or Spanish. Um, I don't think we had a single Spanish article in the final in the final list. So all of our articles were English, but because I do speak both languages, we thought that we could um, include both languages in this. And then our search criteria was between January 1st, 1988, which is when the IPCC was established to our last search being run on May 31st, 2021. Um, so we're almost at a year. Um, we decided before we submitted this article for publication that we were not going to update the review just because every time we would update our searches, we would get more and more articles to comb through and it was just becoming overwhelming for the team, having already um, looked at almost 8,000 abstracts and decided, did they fit? Did they not fit? Um, so we just made the executive decision to cut this review off on the 31st of May of last year, and then we'll see kind of what our reviewers say. Um, and then we excluded anything that was about heat, injury, or cooling interventions in athletes and sports. Um, so that's been one of the big ones over time have been athletes, the military, there's been this big focus on heat related illness or exposure to extreme colder temperatures, but just due to athletes have to be able to play in the snow, for example, we always see those football teams that are playing in the snow in November, you have military personnel who back in the eight, 70s, 80s, 90s, they were um, in climates that were 
much hotter than what we had here, but the intention of the interventions and what they were doing was inherently not about climate change. So we tried to keep all of the interventions included in this study as specific to climate change as possible and not, we kept throwing this word around climate tangential. So we kept having things um, as we would be talking that would be like, well, this is related to climate change. This is related to human health, but it was always on the outskirts and it never tackled it head on. And that's what we were really interested in were those that had those direct relationships between climate change and human health. And it took a lot of discussions. It took a lot of um, thinking and talking between the team about what the goal of the review was for us to be even be able to successfully um, review the abstract and then ultimately the full studies that were included. Uh, Liz, if you'll go to the next slide too, please. So this is our lovely Prisma flow diagram. So as you can see, we identified almost 14,000 records initially through all of our various searches that we did. Once those duplicates were removed, we had 8,700 abstracts um, that we needed to go through. And then we were going through removing some duplicates. We excluded any of the um, morbidity and mortality weekly reports, any non-US studies, that got our team down to right at 8,000. And I wanna say the first time that we did this, we had right at 7,000. And then when we reran our search, we had approximately 1,000 new studies that we had to comb through. And then from that, we, we took those 8,091 abstracts and as a team, and this is why our team was so huge because people would do four or 500 and then they would just burn out and then we would have to find someone else who could help go through these articles. Um, and from the, that screening alone, we had almost 300 full text articles that we then had to read as a team and decide because we had two people looking at each article. So essentially we read 600 articles. Um, and then we had to decide from those 600, not that it's 600, it's 300, but times two, because everyone's being read twice. We had a final inclusion of 49. Um, you can see those 248 were excluded for various reasons, um, with the majority being they weren't truly about climate change. They were that climate tangential, but the authors would talk about heat illness, but they would never use the term climate change. And so we excluded them because we wanted this review to be very much about climate change and not the tangential pieces of it. Um, from that, we then moved on to our data abstraction and uh, we extracted pertinent data for each of the articles, um, such as the author, the study location, what the intervention was, what their methods were, what domain at the wheel, and then um, what the results were from this. And you can go to the next slide, Liz, too. And so this is how we started that data extraction process. We really relied on confidence. If you have done a systematic review or you've never done a systematic review, I highly recommend confidence. Um, I've done a scoping review that had about 300 articles where we analyzed all the articles by hand. However, Covidence makes it so easy. I'm a big proponent. It does all of the tracking. So as you, as you can see, you can see your team progress in the bar that's in green and purple, and then all your different pieces of it. So this screenshot is the title and abstract screening. So when you go into it, you'll just be looking at titles and abstracts. And so you're reading them really quickly. And then you're saying include, um, it's either yes, maybe, or no. And a yes is include, a maybe they treat as yeses, and then a no is an exclude, and then it is screened by a second person. And then if there's congruency between the two reviewers, the article is either included or excluded. If there is incongruency between the two reviewers, it goes to a special pot. And that special pot is where you're resolving the conflicts, as you can see. And so for us, we did that as a team. We felt like um, in order for all of us to be on the same page about how we were working through these articles, we needed to be resolving all of our conflicts as a team. Um, for the title and abstract screening, it was pretty easy to resolve the conflicts once we did, once we had like two, a couple weeks of us working together and deciding, okay, this is what we're really looking for, this is what we're not looking for. Um, and so we were able to go through those fairly quickly. 
Um, it got to then once you did the full text screens, and again, you're doing the same thing. Covenance automatically moves those that have congruency and are included in the study to the full text screening. It was there that we noticed we were having to have more of those one-on-one -on -one conversations to determine what the other reviewer of the article was thinking, what they thought behind the article. Um, and I would actually say the full text screening took just as long as the title and abstract screening, it, just because it was more, more that intellectual review, whereas the title and abstract, you could tell fairly quickly after you did about 200 of them what we were looking for. Um, and then once you do your full text screening, you then get your articles that you can extract or not. And this is where we did deviate from Covidence. We did not use the extraction feature in Covidence. We used, we created tables in Microsoft Word and then uploaded them into Google Drive so that we could all have access to the live documents across our multiple platforms easily. Um, again, you can see over here on the right, some of the other strengths and weaknesses of confidence, but overall is a very good tool for conducting systematic reviews. Okay, next slide. So our data extraction and synthesis, this was done by five reviewers from that initial team on the list. And we each extracted eight to 14 articles, just depending on the workload. Some of our newer reviewers who hadn't been in the, the abstract and title and full text screen, we gave them a heavier workload here in terms of extraction. Again, we used Microsoft Word, Google Docs, and we were extracting the author and study location, sample size, the piece of the wheel. Really, this fourth column, we would do the study design as it was rated by our MMAT tool. And this was the mixed methods appraisal tool. I'll talk about it a bit, but this was how we assessed for bias in these studies. Um, we ended up determining interventions, policy simulations. Um, those were the three broad categories of interventions that we included. So we included which one we had categorized it as, and then we just gave each intervention a name. Some of that came from the literature where as the authors were publishing on their intervention, they had named it. Otherwise, we just kind of gave it a general name based off of what was happening. We talked about the health outcomes, the statistical findings, we added in, was there any confounder assessment? So if they were a quantitative analysis of a intervention, did they assess for confounders? And then we listed um, in STARS our rating of the MMAT tool, which can be rated from one to five. And I believe the MMAT tool is on the next slide, Liz. So we can jump there. Yep, so this is the Mixed and Methods Appraisal Tool. This is a really good tool for studies, albeit scoping reviews, systematic reviews. If you're trying to take a lot of evidence, whenever your question is more murky, such as ours, it's not very, very specific, and you're getting both quantitative studies, qualitative studies, mixed methods studies, and you're like, well, how do we assess all of these using some similar tool? And this did change. We did, we had picked out a tool, and I forget the name, but it was related to exposures and environmental health sciences. And so our thought was, well, climate change would be the exposure, and then we could assess each article um, through that lens. But it came, it became apparent very quickly that our articles would not fit into the tool, so we needed a broader tool. Um, and so for each of these articles, you first start off by answering two questions. Are there clear research questions? And do the collected data allow um, the research questions to be addressed? And if there's a yes for both of these questions, you can rate the article on the MMAT tool. Um, depending on what the article looks like, it can either be qualitative, it can be mixed methods, and then there are three different types of quantitative. There's quasi-experimental, observational, and randomized control trial. Um, and so you then decide which of those five categories the article fits in, and then from that you answer the questions. A simple yes, no's. Um, there are handbooks out there that tell you how to do this and what you're looking for. We did refer to them as we were getting into the into the meat of this um, for the first couple, but it became, this was a very easy and simple tool, and it also gave us a lot of good data about our articles, because we were really kind of worried, how are you going to make the comparisons between all these different article types, um, but this tool allowed us to do that, and this process, again, was done, we used Excel, and so I just created an Excel spreadsheet, and then we went through each study name was listed, and then we um, added, so again, each 
study was looked at by two people. So this first one, um, Anna, who is the graduate assistant working with me and myself reviewed. And then we just looked at coherency between the two. And if we were incoherent, we would go back and we would work with the other person to figure out, well, why did you put a no when I put a yes? Or sometimes there was, um, as you're supporting students through this process, just going back and asking them, well, what is a qualitative versus a quantitative study would help kind of resolve some of those issues. Um, so if you're leading a team like this, you have to do a lot of team training. Um, so just think about that if you ever want to do one. And next slide, please. Um, again, we've created our Prisma checklist. This was included in the final, just um, like you do with any scoping review, systematic review, pretty straightforward. Um, and next, please, Liz. And so our results, what did we find? So after we did years, and I'm not lying, it took two and a half years to get to the point where we had results on the systematic review. Um, what did we find? So we had 49 studies. And keep that number in your head because there were only 35 unique interventions identified. So what does that mean? Within those 49 studies, some studies had a unique intervention and some studies used the same intervention multiple times. Um, and then within that, we had 29 quantitative studies, six qualitative studies, and then we had five mixed methods. And it was really interesting. Those qualitative studies that were included, they were probably some of the best intervention evaluations that I think we read because they would go in and they weren't so much concerned about the numbers because a lot of this is hard to quantify with climate change. And um, again, what is the case definition of a climate change related death? But they would go in and talk to people and say, do you think what we did worked? One of them was a um, an emergency clinic set up after a hurricane in Texas that was done with nursing students and nurse faculty. And in order, because there was not an EMR to collect data, so they couldn't go back and analyze data from an EMR, but they went and talked to the learners and the people on the ground being like, did you think this worked? If it worked, what worked best? What didn't work? What could we change going forward? And we saw that um, pretty consistently with these six qualitative studies. And then again, three of our 14 quantitative studies were randomized control trials. So what does this mean? Um, we think about RCTs as being the gold standard for causality, right? And so only three of these studies were a randomized control trial of an intervention um, to reduce the impacts of climate change on human health. And one of them was actually from Emory University and we knew the author who had done it. It was um, one of the other PhD students on the same team that I was on. So there's not a lot of really high quality from an epidemiological standpoint, high quality work being done in this area. But if you take a more liberal approach, you can see that some of these interventions are being assessed in a way that is meaningful to the communities more so than the general the general scientific community. Okay, next slide. Again, within our domains, we had air pollution. Um, there were eight studies, changes in vector ecology. So that's um, having now having mosquitoes or deer ticks in your area that weren't there 10 years ago. There were six specific to water quality were another six. Severe weather, so the hurricanes and tornadoes, wildfires, there were three. Extreme heat, there were two, and one of our RCTs fell in this N of two. We had an increasing allergens, there was just one. Uh, water and food supply, so is there enough water, is there enough food for humans, there was just one. And then we had eight interventions that really they were talking about more climate change broadly and within their studies they had talked about how this intervention was applicable across domains it could be air pollution and extreme heat they go hand in hand right if it's hotter the air the air quality tends to be worse um, and so there were eight studies that went across the domains and next slide So this is just an example of how we presented these results. This is the air pollution table. So you can see um, we have the air quality flag. This was a unique intervention that was used in just one study. And so we would list the name of the intervention in this table. So this is our second table. And it would come from table one where we had listed from the 
studies themselves which intervention they had used. We gave a description of the intervention as that big wide middle column. The next column was this intervention done at a population or an individual level. And these air quality flags, they were done at a population level. They were um, deployed in schools in Southern California to help warn students and teachers and parents how the air quality was that day. And then on the right is the article that used the intervention. And so you can see all the way down at the bottom, this is an example of one of the interventions that was used across studies, and it was wood stove modernization. So helping to replace um, both heating and cooking wood stoves for less polluting, more energy efficient or clean um, natural gas stoves. And that was done at an individual level across multiple studies. And next slide. So what is kind of our, our take home from all of this? So we have all of these different pieces of, we know that there are X amount of studies in this domain, there are X amount of studies talking about this intervention, but what does this all really mean? So within those interventions that were used across the domains, we found that participatory action research or community-based participatory research the methods of that, um, whichever way you want to call it, PAR, CBPR, they were commonly used as a tool for community engagement. Um, it was the most common intervention was going to communities, helping identify what climate change impacts were going to impact their community and the future were and what the community could do about it. And we all kind of scratched our heads. Um, I think everyone on the team looked at me weird whenever I was like, oh, um, the method, research methods as an intervention, they were like, no, no, no. But whenever you got to looking at it, they would always measure the motivation or like the knowledge that was changed um, in the communities by using these methods. They would do intervention development. They would take the results of um, policy, like local policy, and talk about how those policies have been good for health to grow community level, grassroots level support for inter like broader interventions to reduce the impacts of climate change on health. And so I just thought it was really neat that we think about research as being as these methods that help us as research researchers um, to better understand a question, but in these instances, they were being used as an intervention to solve the climate change, um, the issues of climate change at the community level. Um, and next slide. And then again, we found, so we were kind of worried going into this that there wouldn't be very good study quality. Um, and again, if you think about, if you're viewing this from the lens of epidemiology and the gold standard of the randomized control trial for determining causality, um, we only had three studies. However, our bias in our rating tool, the MMAT tool, showed us that overall we had really good studies in the systematic review. Um, the majority received either four or five stars, which is the highest rating you can get on the tool as a five. Um, and within our qualitative work, only one didn't receive that five-star rating, and it was just due to flaws in the article's methods of data collection and the analysis that we didn't feel were appropriate. Probably if we had been the ones reviewing it, we would have been like, you should change this, and then we would have given it a five, but it did get a four. Um, so overall, using that mixed methods approach and drawing on, and this is where my, my, nurse, my nurse side comes out, really that those multiple ways of knowing of we've got quantitative data, we've got qualitative data, we've got mixed methods data. It's going to be the totality of our knowledge that helps us to, to decrease the impact of climate change on human health. And it's not just going to be those gold standard RCTs. And again, if you think about the RCT from an environmental perspective, it may not always be ethical or feasible to do. So we're going to need knowledge from the other epistemologies and those approaches in order to move forward with the science. And next slide, please. Um, so again, as I said, we had that lack of high quality randomized control trials. Um, however, you know, is that really an issue or not from epidemiology and what we as a scientific community say? Yes, it is. Um, from the communities on the ground, maybe not. Um, we did expect that there would have been more published in the um, 
the almost 25 year period that we searched for articles, um, given that climate change has been talked about for years now at this point, not always taken as seriously as it should, um, but we were still shocked nonetheless to find only 49 articles. And next slide, Liz. And then within these articles, they're kind of the holes or the gaps. Um, there were fewer articles that had been published on the effects of extreme heat, severe weather and patterns, particularly those leading to droughts and water shortages. Um, the majority of those severe weather articles that we identified were all about wildfires in the West. Um, and so this is the one of the reasons that we do a systematic review, right, is to find out what needs to come next. And this is an area that I believe will be ripe for picking um, within the scientific community in the future. And it's something that Liz and I both, this is where our research lies, is extreme heat. And so we're working until, I mean, my KO1 on extreme heat is at the NIH being reviewed today. So fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, this is where we're going from here. And then Next slide, Liz. And so again, just the strengths and limitations of this review. So one of the strengths is that this was the first to investigate rural U.S. climate change and human health interventions. And again, we know that because um, we registered our protocol. We went through all of the registrations, trying to figure out what our first question was back whenever this started. And um, I want to say it was late 2018, 20, early 2019. Um, and so we're the first, and yet to today, um, there's not been another systematic review published. Um, one of our limitations, we couldn't do a meta-analysis, but again, um, with how broad our question was and meta-analysis would not have been appropriate. And then we were also, we thought we were going to be able to go through the gray literature. However, <laughs> with the 8,000 <laughs> abstracts that we had to review, we decided very quickly that we did not want to look at the gray literature just due to our own workloads. So there was no gray literature included in this review. And next slide. And that is the end. I will say um, I did check earlier our article status and all review reports have been received. We are waiting our final decision on this article as to either revise and resubmit or reject or maybe an accept with minor revisions if we got very lucky. Um, the online tracker for the journal that it's at said we could expect a decision within one week. So maybe we'll have some good Thanksgiving news. But other than that, I'll turn it over to everyone and hopefully we can answer some of your questions. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. Um, it's always nice to see this presentation um, after all that work that everybody went through. And I see, I don't see all of the co-authors on this call, especially like Sheila Stone, who was really a great contribution to our group. Um, but I really do appreciate the, the, the work that you took to, to like kind of organize the whole team and keep us moving forward. And it's really quite a feat to do on top of uh, everything else, getting your PhD in three years and moving on to Philadelphia and getting, becoming an adult uh, nurse practitioner, my God, such so much stuff. You're a force. A um, and um, anyway, I just wanted to ask if anybody has any questions, um, put it in the chat or just ask questions either way. Yes, Zinzi. Hi, um, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I'm really interested in some of the, what you've identified as rural areas and their particular needs. Have you, in, in terms of that, have you decided on a specific location in the United States to narrow this down? I know you talked about the, the, desertification, well, that's part of it, the desertification and the lack of fresh water, and then the wildfires in the West is, in terms of your article, are you focusing just on one area, um, like one region that's rural, or are you trying to do this in an expansive way across the entire United States? 
Yeah, so the article itself was more aimed at the expanse of like the entire United States. Um, and that was a question we had is like, how do we know these articles are rural? So sometimes it would be looking at the study population where the study was conducted. Sometimes we were even Googling um, the official <laughs> classifications of an area to kind of figure out where it was. Um, so the article itself is just meant to be um, generally in the US, like we need more work in rural health, right? My own personal research um, surrounds heat illness in the rural areas, both urban and rural. So looking at the differences in both Philadelphia, um, the greater metro area, and then also within Atlanta. Um, I can tend to keep my clinical practice in the rural areas, <laughs> hoping that one day we'll be able to do some really cool things with rural people and agricultural lands, not just agricultural workers, but broader rural communities. Um, so I think you can take it either way. The article was meant to excite people about just rural health in general um, related to climate change. But me personally, I do focus on more so the East Coast, um, which we don't have the wildfires, the, the, desert, the desertification that's happening. So that's where I'm at. Thank you for that answer. I live in a very remote rural community on the West Coast. And so I'm happy to talk with you or collaborate in the future if you do decide to, to look at the West Coast and the desertification and how yeah. we're how we're coping with that. Yeah, it's, I would love to. I'll drop my email in the chat. Yeah. Something chat. that I've noticed, at least on this side of the country, that's coming in with climate change and our life support systems, including food and water, is the result in rural communities is gentrification. And the gentrification of wealth moving into these rural communities displaces the population living there below the poverty line or right on the poverty line. And this is contributing in our area, purchasing previously owned forested land. What we see now here is large houses up on the hills and of the local community. And this is really a bipartisan thing is it's the indigenous groups, it is the working class, it is even the loggers that are very red. And what we see is everybody is concerned about this. And it's the, it's the influx of wealth Mm -hmm. the, the UN talks about as that being like the major goal for climate change is what wealth is coming into a rural area and how that really impacts the, the homeless population and that type of thing is, is it feels for me as an ethnic minority, I see kind of a, an analogy with settler colonialism and it's it's, it's devastating everybody and we're very small. So it's hard to talk about that um, in a large way uh, out here. Yeah. So thank you. No, no, no. And I think you're, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Like it is, it is settler colonialism all over again with climate change. And it was, I think another like exciting thing about finding like CBPR finding was we were able to, in our discussion, point readers back to indigenous groups that had been doing this work that just weren't publishing in the academic literature. And it's like, hey, listen, like a lot of this knowledge is just not, not it's not accessible to us in the traditional academic means. And so we're going to have to reach out and create those community connections in order to truly solve this problem. Yes, I'm happy to help with that. We have the Coquille, the Coos, and the Sayusla out here and all of them are are just terrified the way that the coast is being eroded with large houses on the ends yeah. so thank you so much and yeah anytime we can talk about the rural part here thank perfect you. yeah I, I definitely please reach out i'd love to talk i dropped my email in the chat um, yeah, I, I actually was I just returned from a trip to um, the Mississippi Delta, which is another kind of rural space that is not being gentrified <laughs> at all. <laughs> like it's an absolute um, it's an absolute there's no uh, food access. I mean, they grow cotton, um, but there are no stores. There is no fresh fruit or vegetables. There is just petroleum industries 
and um, these uh, ethane cracker plants that are being built to process petroleum into plastic. And so it's become, uh, and I've never seen the Mississippi River so low in my life. I mean, there is no water in the Mississippi because of the drought in the Ohio Valley. Um, and so there's there are some very strange patterns to where people move, um, but there are places that are stuck um, where it, they won't, anytime soon to be gentrified, but they will become even more, um, you know, dire conditions. Uh, I just heard a very interesting article um, about how the rural solutions for places like the Mississippi Delta, um, they were, you know, Instacart is something that came along during the pandemic, right? But it was people, all of a sudden people were ordering Instacart. And so they're now looking at kind of these kinds of interventions where people in cars deliver fresh fruits and vegetables to homes in rural areas that don't have access as an intervention. But is that sustainable? Not, I'm not sure that that's a very short term intervention. So one of the things in our, in our looking at is like what interventions are like implementable at scale, sustainable and, you know, really, that's the problem. I think Daniel was talking about with the RCTs is there, you know, you do it for five years, you say it works or it doesn't work, and then you're done. Um, and so um, looking at long term solutions is something that is just a big challenge. So um, it's interesting to hear about the experience on the West Coast and think about the East Coast and, you know, how all these rural spaces have, you know, similar issues uh, related to fire, drought, extreme weather, water, access. Um, but anyway, uh, do we have other questions or comments? Yes. I see Lisa Hartmeyer on the, on the call. So hello, Lisa. <laughs> UCSF connection. Oh, yeah. It's so good to see you. I'm so inspired by this work. Um, thank you, Daniel and Lisa and everyone who participated and Ruth. Um, I'm just uh, really uh, excited about about this and um, and thinking about how I can uh, go on professionally from uh, you know looking at at similar ideas and things like that. So thank you. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I had to say hi. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, and so one was, "What was our Pico question?" And so we threw Pico out at the very beginning of this systematic review. Um, we did not have a PICO question. And that was because we felt like a PICO style question. It's really, and this is where nursing research can be, in my opinion, almost a little too clinical at times. It was really, well, what's your population? What's your specific intervention, your control, your, um, your other group, your treatment. And it was like, well, we don't like, we don't have that. We're not comparing. There's not enough data to compare. How do we deal with heat illness in African-Americans to Latinos, to white people? And is it better to use um, like a cooling vest or a cooling bandana? Those studies don't exist. And so we could not use PICO in order to guide this systematic review. And then Sarah asked if we, um, classified frontier communities different from rural and we did not as long as it was not in an urban setting in the U.S. it was considered rural. And I'd say also another thing Daniel that we struggled over was this idea of, of policy interventions you know because we're we're you know nurses in the health profession thinking about the interventions got to be related to like the exposure or the outcome health or something reducing air pollution and then we found these policy studies and you know that's kind of where everything we hope would go right you do something to inform policy so we included policies as interventions but it took us a while to kind of go wait well, what's, what's this <laughs> you know the uh or a, a community um like a, what was that like a, a city council that gets together to come up with a policy to deal with stormwater runoff and then evaluate that policy it was kind of almost theoretical maybe or like a modeling exercise and uh so it was it was didn't necessarily have an outcome it was just an intervention you know um, so that that made it challenging and we had we had one of those two that was just a pure modeling paper that was 
if we did X, Y, or Z, it was in Colorado to deal with wired wildfires, this would be the impact of it. And so it was completely theoretical, but it showed that these different interventions, if implemented would lead to this. And so we included that in this paper because a lot of this work, we need to model, we need to know very quickly what different interventions are going to get us um, because we don't really have 10 years to see how an intervention plays out when it comes to climate change. Are you interested in coming up with an intervention right now? That's what I'm working on um, with the International Astronautical Federation. Their Congress in May is completely devoted to climate change. And I'm, more, I'm trying to work on a theoretical abstract for submission to present. Uh, the theme is making, giving tools to policymakers for their acts on climate change. And there will be diplomats and policy changers, policymakers at this conference. So if you're interested in a theoretical, um, like you said, a theoretical one fact or something that we could use, what I, what I was thinking now was combating desertification with marine aquaculture, okay. because the marine aquaculture does not use the precious fresh water, but the plants are edible and they are a biofertilizer that is renewable. Mm -hmm. So, that's what I'm going to be starting a PhD program soon. And that was that is one potential intervention that we can do here on the West Coast is is really utilize the ocean and try to caption car carbon capture that way. Yep. So, yeah. And yeah, no. And I think that's precisely where I want my own career to go <laughs> um, is my KO one has that is in is about intervention development. So taking like data science and the data that we already have back to communities and then using the research products of the data science world as starting points for community conversations to develop interventions related to heat exposure um, in Philly and Atlanta and the outskirts. So yeah, no, I would love to collaborate and yes. <laughs> see what we we'll can cook up together, yeah. The abstracts is not due until December 23rd. And I'm almost guaranteed a, a spot to, because I won an award the last time I was there for my work on climate change and policy. Congratulations. Yes. And so I'm very glad to hear this and um, I will email you. Thank you. Yes. Zinzi, when are you, where, what, where are you starting your PhD program? Actually, so I, I left my position at the college because of some of the things that were happening and going on. And I will be because I already live here in Coos Bay, I'll be starting at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. So I already have all but dissertation from my previous work in biocontainment microbiology. And now that I'm switching fields completely to climate change, all of my research is focused on that, including working with the satellites to track water and fire, because that's what's, this is what I report on on my radio show. So that's, I'm using that because we can, you say you have a K, K award from NINR, you are trying to get this, this funding. NASA is changing its, its way to go towards climate work and anybody can write a grant to NASA. Anyone with a good idea and the potential infrastructure. And so this is how, as without a PhD, I have been able to get the funding for this. And it's often not open to nurses. You know, nurses mm -hmm. are not in the space industry, but we care about the environment. Mm -hmm. And so it's about translating different disciplines into climate change and allowing policymakers to see our ideas and then make decisions that go eventually to the UN or their own governments. So I'm, yeah, I will tell you more about this. I will give the, the link. Any other uh, questions or comments from anybody? I'd say that, you know, the modeling and all the theoretical stuff is the only way that we can actually do anything, right? Because we're not, these are the, the downstream effects of anything that we do are, are so far in the future, right? That we're always, I mean, if we do some, you know, you can do like they've done studies during the Olympics in Atlanta, you know, by stopping cars driving the, the asthma rate dropped, you know, you know, that's an immediate effect. But generally speaking, you're going to be dealing with like 
long-term effects that you can't really monitor until, you know, and hopefully they'll never happen if we take action now and try to address things sooner without waiting for the evidence of, you know, that it's worth it or not, right? Just do it. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. I think we could maybe sign off early unless people have any comments. Um, very nice. Thank you for your positive comments too. Um, yeah, we appreciate thank you all it. For coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. We'll see everybody see you. in January. Yep, January. <laughs> bye. I'll go Thanks, ahead and email you. He yeah. put my email in the chat for you. Oh, please. Yes, I'll stay and get it. I'm so happy I found someone that is willing to work on models. I'm, I, got you. I, I did <laughs> MATLAB and I don't want to do it again. <laughs> work, <laughs> yeah, it. Mechanistic research is, is more of my side of it. So that's actually just if you could create one model based off of one yeah. intervention, that's that's enough to, to present at these conferences and really be able to speak on it and give your call to action, which is what I did last time. It was a direct call to action. And it looks like they're implementing it because Lula won in Brazil. Mm -hmm. The diplomats were there at that time. And I talked with Northrop Gumrin because all these people are defense contractors from the United States that quote, that participate. That's who makes the Artemis rocket, right? Yeah. And they have incredible power. And so they are able to intervene. So what we talked about was an operation. Should that election go the other way, mm -hmm. an operation to come in and 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 really, it, it, there's sovereignty issues, but they're, okay. yeah, there's sovereignty issues, but now they are able to accept that idea. You see the change within the Amazon basin. And in Norway, they've extrapolated this idea to their forests, to be able to preserve their forests as well. So this conference is actually asking for people like you really it, it wants to let that sort of pretend like intervention that's theoretical that maybe we could make happen happen yeah on a large scale if you here you go defense contractor try, try to go get do this you yeah, know, yeah yeah you have Sorry. the power so go ahead and do it and that's what all the scientists there will be displaying for these diplomats when they meet um during the uh during what they have as a like a small general assembly Okay. Um, gotcha. With countries, and it is everyone right now. Only the Russian Federation and China are not participating. Okay. But this is a, a. There's a lot of it in East Africa, right? The desert desertification and what's happening with the conflict there. So it involves UN peacekeeping forces as well. Yeah. And that need in you know UNICEF is the one right now responding to so much of this, and what the conference is looking for is not really a space conference. It wants the technology, the, the minds of people like you to propose your ideas on climate change because you are so distant from a physicist or an engineer, right? They don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're building the rockets and the satellites. So I'm yeah. really, I'm happy I got to talk to you. I'm, yeah, no, let's, um, we'll reach out and maybe we can have coffee via Zoom sometime. So. Absolutely. Thank Perfect. You. Have all a right. wonderful Thanksgiving, you all. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye, Bye, Liz.